Oh, hello everybody. So today we have guests in our studio and I'm very proud to meet this woman. It's a very, very famous and interesting personality and you will understand why. So welcome, Janine Di Giovanni. It's a multi-award winning journalist and author, co-founder and co-director in the Reconing Project. We will talk about this, mm -hmm. what is the project. And as well as the war reporter that uh, was working, have been working in hot spots around the world for years, right? Yes, absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's, it's a real honor to be in Ukraine, to be in Kyiv, to be with the Ukrainian people and to be on your show tonight. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. It's my honor and my pleasure too. But I asked you before the start of our conversation if it's the first time you're visiting in Ukraine and it appeared that it's not the first time. So how many times you've been here, have been here before war and uh, what impressions you have right now? Well, uh, I've been to Ukraine many times. Um, as the executive director of the Reckoning Project right now, what I am focused on with my team, which is led by um, Natalia Gumenyuk in Ukraine and Peter Pomerantsev, who is a Ukrainian-born British journalist and academic, we are documenting war crimes inside Ukraine and we are verifying them and helping to build cases for prosecution, um, as well as also making long format stories and films to counter Kremlin disinformation mm -hmm. so that we basically um, can tell the truth of what is happening here. Um, you ask me what is happening here, and I will tell you this morning, um, well, all last night there were air raids um, by drones, uh, Iranian-made drones, in many cases coming from the Russian assault on Ukraine. Um, so this is, of course, something very terrifying for the population, very cruel, because the purpose, one of the systematic attempts by Vladimir Putin is to terrify the local population. Um, today, around noon, there were more uh, rocket strikes, um, which basically um, is a way of trying to take a hold of Ukraine. Mm. So since the full-scale invasion in February 2022, um, what the Reckoning Project and what I work on is to document these kind of crimes, the systematic attacks on civilians, but also torture, deportation, forcible abduction of Ukrainian children to Russia. Um, generally, Putin's strategy for the Russification of Ukraine, or his attempts at the Russification of, of Ukraine. Uh, we will talk uh, a little more detail about this project and how you do your job in uh, um, deoccupied cities. But uh, now it's interesting for me if you manage to speak uh, to the people of uh, free cities of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So their attitude, like we talked now before our interview, how uh, accept uh, the Ukrainians all these missiles attacks during more than all year. And the more interesting for me, what's how do you see? What's the point? I mean, what's the aim of Putin? It's like doing the same stupid thing and waiting for another result. And it's a lot of money yes. that just spread into air by Russians. So you made two points. One is the normalization of the war. And that's a terrible thing because people now, it's uh, 16 months into the war. So people are becoming accustomed to being woken up in the middle of the night by air raids. And that's in Kyiv. If in the southeast, people are enduring terrible conditions and terrible bombing and terrible deprivation. Um, it's, it's really tragic to see that so many lives have been absolutely disrupted, whether it's families of soldiers who have been killed or on the front line, whether it's people who have been injured or people who have lost their homes or people who've been separated from family or people who've been forced to leave Ukraine. Um, it's very painful to be in exile when your country is at war. And you know perhaps you've left because it's safer for your children or for your elderly parents. But in fact, anyone who is driven away from their home because of war is incredibly um, a very painful position to be in. Um, what is the point of this war? Well, 
Only Mr. Putin can answer that, but I would like to take a guess. He wants to conquer Ukraine. Um, he wants to subdue the Ukrainian people who have fought so hard for justice, democracy, freedom for so many years. Um, he wants this land to be his. He has an imperial notion of what is Russia. Um, he has uh, racist views that there are no such thing as Ukrainian people, and there's no such thing as a Ukrainian identity. We know this is propaganda, brainwashing, and that many of the Russian people who are held hostage by him today are forced to take this news in because that's all they're able to get. So I think that his aim is to win, but he won't win. He will not conquer Ukraine. Um, Ukrainians will never allow themselves to kneel. They, you, will win. Um, I don't know when this war will end. It might be six months, it might be three years, but I know it will end. And I know there will be a victory for Ukraine. But you know, these tactics of terrorizing mostly civilian uh, people in different cities, what you can observe right now in Kiev and mm -hmm. during this May, this month, it's, it, it's all related, related more than 15, I wouldn't even count how many times missile attacks uh, continuing. So these tactics, uh, it's the same that he uh, uses, uh, used in uh, different other territories that you visited as a, a war reporter. So if these tactics worked, there, so he is sure that it will work here, but it doesn't work, so why he continues to do this? How do you think? Well, I've reported many wars, 19 wars, um, and three Putin wars. Oh. So I was in his very first war, the Second Chechen War, uh, which Putin came to power in August, I think, and, and 1999, and in January 2000, um, late January 2000, um, Chechnya, Grozny, the capital, fell to Russian forces. Um, I was also in Syria for a long time. And, of course, Putin became involved in Syria in 2015, going to help President Bashar al-Assad um, by sending air power. So Putin's responsibility was largely um, air power over cities like Aleppo, so destroying them, hitting civilian targets, terrorizing people by hitting largely residential areas yeah. in Aleppo, um, also hospitals, which is something he also does in Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. So the targeting of uh, medical facilities, of kindergartens, of schools, of uh, heavily residential areas, all of these, of course, banned by Geneva Conventions. Um, he has basically no, absolutely no concern for human life, civilian life. Um, all of his tactics, all of his strategies show that what he wants to do is to kill as many people as possible, to frighten those that remain, and to try to silence as many people as possible. You know what's interesting? When I was uh, preparing for this interview, I was trying to remember uh, the tactics that Putin uh, used uh, in other different regions and countries. And as long as I visited Georgia not long ago, and I even produced uh, two episodes of documentary about uh, war in Abkhazia, about war in Samachablo, and uh, using these tactics, it's almost the same. And it's continuing more than two, 20 years. But if we look back before Putin, it was Yeltsin when Abkhazian war started. So Russia is continuing to use the same tactics over and over and over and over. And only now, after 30 years, the society of uh, Western world, the society of uh, normal world, paid attention. How it happened? How do you think? Why they were silent all of these times? I mean, they were talking, but they didn't solve this problem. They gave much more power to Putin for all these years, not punishing his actions in other countries. Well, there's many people around the world who have not been punished for their actions. Um, Bashar al-Assad in Syria, for instance, is one. Um, terribly, right now, he's even being normalized by many countries, almost as though the, the terrible things he did during the Syrian war, which is still ongoing, he's been forgiven for. I will never forgive him, and I hope that justice does reach him. I hope to see him in The Hague someday. 
Um, but I don't think that, I don't think it was the West that allowed Putin to become what he is. I think that Putin is a disruptor of democracy. I think his intentions are to disrupt Europe and therefore Ukraine, which was on, is on the path to becoming part of the EU and of NATO. Um, a way, the invasion is a way of reclaiming his stake in, in this part of the world. Um, I think that Putin um, invading a sovereign country, Ukraine, was again his way of showing his will and his power, but he's a fading power. And we see how he is, um, it's almost as though to me, his actions on the battlefield right now are that of a desperate man, knowing that he's losing, knowing that most of the world is behind Ukraine right now, knowing that Ukraine is getting F-16s and tanks and weapons and training from Western countries. What Putin has done by invading Ukraine is not just a blatant act against democracy, but it's also a way of saying, we're going back to the Cold War. You know, it is basically uh, Russia, China, Iran, um, countries like this supporting him. Uh, unfortunately, the global south. So what do we mean by that? We mean Latin America, um, Middle Eastern countries in Africa that had traditionally been loyal to Moscow, largely because they, they were educated there. Some of their mm -hmm. leaders were educated there. Um, they tended during the Cold War to look to Moscow rather than to Washington, um, look to, towards totalitarianism um, rather than towards democracy. Ukraine always wanted democracy, freedom, um, the things that we believe in when we say democracy, what are they? It's human rights, it's freedom of speech and expression, and it's rule of law. These are all the things Putin despises. So in a sense, what you are fighting right now, you're not just fighting for Ukraine, you are fighting for democracy and for freedom for the entire world. I really hope right now a lot of people compare what's happening in Ukraine today to world wars. You know, is this, or is this World War II that we're, are we going to see another World War II? Are we going to see another, is it World War I? Or are we already living in the process of this war? I hope not. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we have proxy wars at the moment, which, for instance, you know, you, Ukraine is getting a lot of support from the West, from the U.S. I'm very proud of what President Biden, for all his flaws, um, he, he has really stepped up to help Ukraine and has kind of set an example for other countries, you know, countries that need to help more, like Germany and, um, and Italy, and, and also um, to, to, to really set an example and to, to come to train and equip Ukrainians with, with weapons. Um, I don't think we're in World War II yet. I, I, I think if, if I sat here and said that, I think I'd feel um, terribly worried. And, and also, um, I think it would involve a much larger scale. I was very worried when I saw China getting involved with negotiations um, on the side of Russia, but um, I think that China has their own issues to deal with right now with Taiwan, so they're more focused on that. Um, I think that there will be containment of the Ukrainian war in Europe for the moment. Um, let's see what happens with the spring offensive, which, Mm -hmm. could happen any day now, any day. right? Mm -hmm. Could be this week. If we talk about imperialistic ambitions of Putin, because everybody's talking about this, yeah. and these ambitions uh, in the 21st century looking very uh, interesting because uh, he couldn't even cope the situation, economical situation in his own country. So is it really imperialistic ambitions just to grab lands and to uh, uh, re recollect this so-called Soviet Union? Or just the question of money and uh, influence uh, on the continent? Because wherever, wherever Russian world, or as we say here, Ruski Mir, yes. is coming, they're only destroying everything, killing everybody. Yeah. There's just, just a plain land. Scorched earth. So yeah. what's his imperialistic ambitions? 
if he's just destroying even uh, Russian-speaking regions first here in Ukraine, but not West Ukraine, where he was looking for Bandera, for example. Right. Again, I wish I could be inside his head and know what he's thinking or know what his logic is, but my analysis of it is that he invaded a sovereign country um, in February 2020. I have to tell you, I mean, as late as January 2022, I did not think he would do it. The invasion was February, in February, mid-February 2022. Even as he was amassing troops on the border, I thought it was bluffing. I did not think he would go as far as to invade a sovereign country. So his ambitions are massive, absolutely massive. Napoleonic, perhaps, um, but what happened to Napoleon? So, I mean, you have to look at history to see what happens to leaders with this kind of burning and fatal ambition, which is what Putin has. It's just interesting that if we look uh, at the attitude of uh, French people towards Napoleon <laughs> during that times, and uh, look at the attitude of German people towards Hitler yes. at that time, and it's different situation economically and with ambitions and what they gave to the people at that times, and uh, in what circumstances uh, now living Russian people, and they still support their Führer. Oh, Putler, put, put, I don't know how to call him, actually, I'm sorry, uh, after today's missiles attack. But uh, let's talk about propaganda. Yeah. It's our, like a colleague, journalist, mm -hmm. it's our field. So I want to ask you about uh, the opportunity to influence. Because nine years during all this war, because war started in 2000, 2014, but still we hear from a lot of people that Donbass has been bombed for eight years. You know all these mm -hmm. messages. The sacrificed boys in the trousers or whatever. And uh, Russian forces... You can hear. So all these narratives are still continuing during mm -hmm. nine years of war, but still now, while Putin is bombing our cities, it's still existing. Why? How do you think? What's wrong? Why these people don't look for the alternative information? They can't. I don't think we I don't think we can blame. There are certainly people working in Russia right now who are trying to undermine him. And you know and I know what that means. It's incredibly dangerous for them. He has he is a totalitarian leader. His regime is terrifying. If you most of the people who were opposing him have fled. Those who haven't have gone underground. The great journalists like Anna Politskyeva, who of course reported from Chechnya, was assassinated. Um, we know the, 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 the KGB spy turned British spy, uh, Litvinenko, was poisoned to death. Um, Putin silences people, um, immediately silences them, kills them, poisons them. Um, so if you are an ordinary Russian person right now and you're sitting trying to keep your family alive, um, you don't have many options. You can't watch Freedom TV. You can't watch uh, CNN. You can't read the BBC. And all of the Western journalists have fled except for those who've been imprisoned. So he is operating a fully-fledged totalitarian regime. One thing about regimes like that, and we know this from Stalin times, that the writers and the thinkers, poets like Anna Akhmatova, you can't imprison someone's mind, or Alexander Solzhenitsyn. You can't, you can imprison them, you can starve them, you can beat them, but you cannot, you cannot imprison their mind. So what the best of all worlds would be for these people who are still inside Russia to rise up somehow, to rise up somehow and to overthrow him, overthrow him themselves, because that, I think, is the only way if there's some kind of internal coup. About our throne, it's an interesting uh, moment uh, for uh, the politicians of uh, the collective West. But first, I want to say and stress that still in Russian Federation, there's an opportunity to watch YouTube, to read Telegram channels. And okay, 
they're afraid they might not have alternative media, international media. Right. They might not believe in everything, that crap that they see on the propaganda yeah. channel. But still, if you read a lot of Telegram channels with Russians or TikTok or other social media, there are lots of hateful speeches towards Ukrainians. Of course. They're happy about bombing. Of course, of course. Uh, or they don't believe. What, or they do not believe. So part of, what, can I talk about what we do at the Reckoning Project okay. and why it's it's really important okay. to um, to document war crimes. So at the Reckoning Project, the Reckoning Project was founded by myself and Peter Pomerantsev, and we work with Natalia Gumenyuk here in Ukraine. We document war crimes, Kremlin war crimes. Um, we verify them, and then we use our archives for two two ways. One is to help help prosecutors build their cases and build their trials against Putin and his, his machine. The other side of it is that we counter Russian propaganda and disinformation by writing the truth. And the truth is in our evidence. And evidence does not lie. So when you talk about propaganda or messaging, or when people talk about strategic communications, I don't engage in that at all because what I believe in is that the truth is so horrible that you don't need to exaggerate. You don't need to have a, a vision of a strategy, strategic communications to penetrate a population. You just tell the truth of what is happening in Ukraine, of the war crimes, of the children that have been taken from places like Mariupol, put on buses, bus to Russia so that they could be adopted by Russian families and russified. Now that is a way of erasing Ukrainian culture. Or of the torture, or of the hundreds of people who were killed in Bucha, and the way they were killed. Not just, they weren't just casualties of war or collateral damage, they were deliberately assassinated and murdered. So in my view, as a human rights investigator, we do not need to exaggerate or to worry about messaging. And somehow you're, you are right. If Russian people want to see the truth or find the truth, they will find a way to get it. I'm not a technology expert. I don't even know how to use TikTok. Mm -hmm. But I do know that there are always alternative ways of finding out what the truth is. And if any of those people are listening, I hope that they do their very best to try to find out what Vladimir Putin is doing in terms of war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine. I talked about this with my colleague lately, and uh, he said me that he told, I I'm sorry, if you are afraid, we can get to the shelter. You're not. It's fine. Okay. I had, I had to tell you that. So he asked me, okay, you have the alternative information. You have all the facts mm -hmm. that you gather. But how make these people not just to, to get the interest to read through these uh, investigations and all these facts, but to believe in it? Because even now, they still continue to say, this is fake, you are all lying. Bucha is a production of Hollywood, uh, yeah. whatever. Well, they weren't there. Directors. They weren't there. We were there, so that, there I mean... There were 1,000, 1,000 of journalists accredited in uh, Lviv Media Center. I was there and I was shocked. 1,000 international media, all with the uh, cameras, all with their eyes witnessing. But this is what, this is what Russian propaganda has always done. They did it during this, this Syrian war. Um, there is right now two genocides that I've worked in personally, Bosnia and Rwanda. Uh, Srebrenica in Bosnia in 1995, Rwanda in 1994. There are revisionist historians who say um, these, these aren't the correct figures, it didn't happen this way. In Srebrenica, the people who were killed were casualties of war, they were combatants. It was a reprisal for um, Bosnian attacks on Serbs. Um, so history gets completely rewritten. And that is why at the Reckoning Project, we are so concerned about having our archive verified Verification. Mm -hmm. um, as I said before, evidence does not lie. So they can believe whatever they want to believe. Frankly, my job is not, I'm not a propagandist for the Ukrainians. So it is not my job to convince people inside Russia or in other parts of Ukraine who say this didn't happen. My job is to get this evidence to courts.
and that's what I will do. Um, that is what the Reckoning Project does. We will get this evidence to court, and then those courts will determine whether or not Vladimir Putin is guilty of war crimes. But now it's interesting, we started with this, that uh, the punishment didn't found uh, almost all the war cr criminals uh, during our era, our period. Mm -hmm. uh, let's remember Chechnya, let's remember Georgia, let's remember Syria, let's remember the latest um, I'm mixed up in my head. So, uh, all, Putin all wars or just not, not just Putin. Afghanistan, Iraq, yes, Yemen, the only thing, Ethiopia. The only place it's Yugoslavia, and the only uh, war war criminals that were punished uh, it's those who made massacres in Yugoslavia. Well, not and not enough of them were published. There's punished. There are many, many of them roaming freely today. Absolutely. So, That's why my question is, yeah. we are so sure that all this uh, special tribunal that will be organized uh, for punishing the war uh, criminals from the Russian Federation. I'm not saying names right now, but anyways, all this uh, investigation, all this data that you are gathering and make an archive. So what make you so sure that it might happen during our lifetime? What is the alternative to do nothing? To look away? No, absolutely. You are so, right. Absolutely. What is the alternative? I mean, I cannot afford to be cynical. If I was, I wouldn't be able to do this work. So I absolutely believe it will happen. I also can say from experience, I have never seen the galvanization of the international community to push forward international justice in Ukraine. It's never worked this fast, never. Not for Bosnia, not for Rwanda, certainly not for places like Ethiopia where a million people have been killed, no one's doing anything. Not for Syria, not for Yemen, not for Iraq, Afghanistan, the list goes on. It, Ukraine, things are moving rapidly. There are scores of people in Ukraine investigating war crimes the way the Reckoning Project is. You once said that who cares about Syria and Bosnia, one of your uh, speeches mm -hmm. in TED, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken, 10 years ago. I yeah. will remember some more words from this, mm -hmm. uh, your speech, but anyways, you said who cares about Syria and Bosnia at that time, yeah. uh, while sitting in their ho warm places, cozy and so on. But uh, Ukraine changed the situation. Now everybody in the world knows where yeah. is Ukraine and the information spreading so fast and there are lots of people and organizations that are helping you, helping right. us together all this. Uh, so do you think that world uh, of media and world of uh, international organizations, uh, peaceful organizations uh, and uh, legal law organizations really changed during this? Why so attentive to uh, Ukraine right now? I think there's many reasons. I think, um, look, you know, the world did not act for Bosnia um, or they acted far too late. And, I think 350,000 people could have been saved had Bill Clinton um, done more at the time. But instead, they acted in Kosovo uh, four years later after the war in Bosnia ended in 1999. Um, 19 NATO countries went to war for Kosovo, a tiny, tiny country um, that suffered under Slobodan Milosevic, but not to the extent that Bosnia did. So why Kosovo, why not Bosnia? Um, why Ukraine? I think for the reasons I gave you earlier, that I think many people believe that um, Ukraine is carrying the weight of fighting for democracy and being basically the line, the red line, holding Putin back. If, you know, I always say that if President Trump was in power right now, Putin would be all the way in Poland. <laughs> you would not have gotten the aid from America that you've gotten from President Biden. And, you know, if President Biden hadn't done it, would the other European countries have fallen in line? Remember that the influence the U.S. still has, you know? Um, so I think that, um, I think most analysts would say that Ukraine is fighting for Ukraine, but Ukraine is also fighting for democracy to keep Putin from pushing his imperialistic vision, as you call it, even further. But uh, one more thing I wanted to ask you about, um, let's remember your speech at the TED platform. Okay. Yeah, at ten, it was 10 years <laughs> ago. So you talked about the siege of Sarajevo and the woman that gave her child to a stranger on a bus just to save her child. And then you were talking about uh, how people help each other to survive during the siege then. 
yeah. is the same that's going on in Ukraine right now. But afterwards, you had many wars, your wars, as a journalist, as a reporter. So what do you think, what do you see in changes since then in your perception of your work as a war reporter? And uh, how these journalists, reporters working in the hotspots can really affect globally on the situation, not just locally, to gather the evidences for the history, but affecting globally to change the situation with stopping this conflict, this conflict, and this conflict? I, you know, look, since I started as a reporter in Bosnia, there is the rise of technology, technology and social media. Social media has changed everything, and it has also contributed to propaganda, to fake news, to false information, to the spread of it. I mean, you talk about telegram channels. There are telegram channels devoted to um, disturbing people's notions of the truth. So in a sense, it was a lot easier to work in the 1990s before there was internet, before there was YouTube, before there was TikTok, uh, Snapchat, um, Twitter, Facebook. When you just worked and you, in my case, I worked for a newspaper, I wasn't television, um, you filed your story, it was printed. Um, the next day there would be another newspaper. You would add on to your story. Today, you know, the risk of, first of all, people, people tend to fight their wars on Twitter. Um, I find it very disconcerting that people's analysis is confined to 32 characters. Mm -hmm. Is it 32? I don't even know. <laughs> um, or that TikTok is a way of explaining what the Ukrainian war is. Um, it, it's just not enough. I mean, we, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm old fashioned, but we need to go back to reading books and history and looking at history because history is essentially where, where the answer to everything lies. So I tell my team at the Reckoning Project now that we are the keepers of historical memory. What we are doing today by building our archives, which are built from witness statements, this is a way of ensuring that the truth will always prevail because evidence doesn't lie. So that, to me, is, is where the truth is. Um, you were asking about how journalism has, has changed since that time and the impact that journalists have. Well, I think that influencers, so-called influencers, are greatly um, given far too much credit. Um, because most of the time they don't know what they're talking about. So, and I think that the people who follow them or tend to listen to what they say need to read between the lines and go back and do their homework and find out, you know, what the real story is. Whether that's by reading um, the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Pravda, um, or the, yeah, or, or watching Hramadsky or watching Freedom TV. I don't know. Everyone has their own way of digesting the news. But I think that you have to have several different sources. And whether or not we have impact um, is, I mean, again, in, in our personal case at the Reckoning Project, our impact will lie on whether or not we get to court. That's our impact. How we affect government policy is, is how closely we tell the truth. This was one more very interesting information from my colleague here in this building, actually, mm -hmm. from Gromadsky. But uh, he asked me, thankful I visited the conference for international conference for journalists in Bucha. Mm -hmm. And you presented this conference at the beginning. So that's how I knew you. And he asked me, how can you be sure that all the evidences that you gather are absolutely objective? Because uh, when you get this, the person might be in the situation of stress. Yes, and trauma. he might trauma yeah. he might add some illusions right. of what's happened to me and the journalist might be in emotional situation too uh, not stable watching observing all of this so how can we be sure and uh, i understand that you have uh, uh, some special practice yes. uh, how to methodology yes methodology so can it's you... a very good question yes. your colleague asked um very good so he made two important points one is that you cannot interview a traumatized person. Of course, everyone's traumatized. Let's just take Krematorsk, right? Yes. If you were in the, in the aftermath of the Krematorsk train station, which was rocketed and more than 66 people were killed, how many injured? Over you know, hundreds injured. Um, and you went up as a journalist to interview someone. You 
we wouldn't do that. So we have a very strict methodology. First of all, um, we are governed by the principle of do no harm. So when you interview someone as a journalist, it's very different than the way we interview our witnesses. First of all, they're consenting witnesses. We need to have papers signed before we start. Second, all of our researchers, journalists, researchers, are trained in trauma, in recognizing trauma, in making sure they do not re-traumatize someone who is telling their story. Because let's say you have a victim of rape, sexual assault and you sit down with them and you ask them to revisit what happened to them, you can very easily re-traumatize them, which is very dangerous. So our researchers are taught how to recognize that, how not to do it, how to avoid the dangers of putting someone in a deep psychological distress. Um, third, a traumatized witness statement isn't going to be admissible in court. A yes. prosecutor will that throw it out. That was the next question. Well, absolutely. absolutely. They'll throw it out. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, we don't want to waste our time and the time of, of prosecutors who are very busy by giving them unreliable witnesses. So there's been times, you know, and I've been on in situations where we're interviewing someone and we know that they're an unreliable witness. So we will very politely thank them and stop the interview process. Um, so we are different from journalists. It's a very different, we don't ask leading questions. We often go back several times for an interview. Um, and we use our own methodology, which it was devised by my chief data analyst, who is a highly experienced um, uh, investigator and helped build other war crime tribunals. And we basically um, remember at all times the most important principle is not to do any harm. So I think that basically, in a nutshell, explains our methodology and our vision and our, our philosophy. Can there be uh, journalistic standards and ethics uh, working in war, especially uh, for Ukrainian journalists? who are living in, in Ukraine who are suffering the same? Yeah, very hard. So I, I was just talking about this today. First of all, you're reporting on your own country, right? So the emotional level of it is going to be that much higher for you. This is your country that's being destroyed. Um, it was the same for, say, Iraqi or Afghan journalists who, although they did not have the same tradition of journalism that you've had, and especially since Maidan in 2014, the level of Ukrainian journalism is very high, right? Um, it's very good. Um, so you are reporting, and you're meant to report objectively, on your own country being brutalized. That is not easy. I believe that all Ukrainian journalists should be debriefed by a trauma specialist mm -hmm. once a month, um, at least, to just talk to someone about what you saw, what is haunting you, what is troubling you, what ethical dilemmas you are having. Um, you need someone to, to bounce this off because it's a tremendous weight on you. It's your country. Yeah, we live one day. I you mean, live one day at a time. Well, so. I think by giving you back your, your, your justice, your sense of justice and what you deserve um, is a small way that the Reckoning Project, by using only Ukrainians to do this work, is, is really important to us. And I'm just, um, I'm just here to mentor them and to lead them, give them my experience in other war zones and my experience establishing patterns of um, criminal activity and atrocities and how we can link them um, to Putin's actions today. You've been working in this profession yeah. for, for many years and uh, first of all, are you so brave? Because once I, I remember uh, this film with Michelle Pfeiffer and um, Robert Redford. Oh yes, remember? up close and personal. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. That's association with the women yeah. and the men yeah, in this war. Yeah. A bit ridiculous war. film. <laughs> now yeah. I understand yeah, being yeah. in this profession, this is ridiculous. Yeah. But anyways, are you such a brave and how you cope with emotions? I'm All very the time brave. seeing the I... deaths, 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 how you live with this? I'm sorry for this question, but. No, no, I mean, I, I don't think I'm very brave. I just think it is my job 
and I think it's something, you know, we all discover early on, hopefully, what we're good at, what we do well, what our passion is, what drives us, what is our motivation. My motivation has always been for justice and for to give a voice to victims who do not have a voice themselves. As an international, well, now I'm a human rights monitor, but I was an international journalist for many years, I did have that ability to give people voice a voice so that it could carry across the world and hopefully affect policy. Um, it's, you know, I, I, I'm, I feel very honored to do this work because in many ways it's, you know, not many people get to do the, the job that they love and they believe in. And I, I believe very much in, in what I do, what my team does, what the Reckoning Project does. Um, I believe in justice, I believe in the law. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And we will still believe in the people's awakening. Yes, absolutely. With your help as well. So thank you very much for this interview. Thank you so much for having me on and, and Slava Ukraini. Thank you.